we have a special guest who's joining us here shortly. Her name is Monique. She is a survivor of child trafficking. We'll give her the full introduction here shortly. But she also owns, founded, and operates a center, a survivor center. It's like a safe house for survivors of abuse and trafficking. So she has a lot to say. It's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. Obviously, there's going to be some deep, dark things we're talking about. We are here to raise awareness, specifically in regards to child trafficking in the USA. So we acknowledge that this is a deep, dark subject. This is an uncomfortable subject. It may be even triggering for some people. However, myself and other people who have survived this evil think it's so important that people know that it exists. And we also think it's important that we share our experiences and the information that we know in order to help other people avoid it. So in my personal case, it's not so much about sharing my unique story. It's more about sharing the things that I can apply generally to pretty much every other situation where an adult is preying upon a child. I'm also going to state for the record that we intentionally use very soft words for the sake of playing nice with this platform. Doing so is just so we don't get shut down, but it's in no way to minimize the atrocities that we're talking about. We're just trying to do this to be safe. So when we avoid harsher words, it's not because we're afraid of facing this evil head on. It's that we want to be here for as long as we can and get this message spread out to as many people as possible. So Vets for Child Rescue is a nonprofit. We are dedicated to exposing and eradicating child trafficking in the USA. It is not just a third world country problem. It's not a far, far away problem. It's happening in our communities at a massive scale. The data is alarming. The data is disgusting, to be honest, the amount of kids going missing, the amount of child trafficking cases reported. But I want you to realize something. The data is based on what's reported. And the majority of this type of crime is not reported. So I am here as a testament of that. I'm also here as a testament of someone who has endured 20 years. I was born and raised into a religious organization environment that was very abusive and harmful and they did traffic children as part of this experience. So because I have endured this and overcome this, I'm also here to tell you what I know about this enemy. I'm here to arm you with the empowerment and the knowledge that you need to arm and empower your children and your family and your communities and your churches and your support groups so that all of us can stand together because this is a massive opponent. Yes, it is. This is a massive opponent. We understand that this is large and alarming. Got you. Hey, Monique. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Monique, do you want to introduce yourself? I feel like you would do your subject more justice. Sure. Um, so my name is Monique Anna, and um, this is my first TikTok and live TikTok. <laughs> so it's fun um, jumping in. Um, I um, am the eldest of 13 children, and we, um, all of us, left uh, the cult that we were born into. Um, I left in 1994, and uh, my family slowly left after that. Um, I heard the term trafficking for the first time in 2014, and I understood that that was what I had experienced. Um, I started to focus on, you know, trying to find local solutions, um, started a nonprofit, uh, which has shifted directions a few times. And right now our focus is on working with the facilitators who are survivors, who are actively helping uh, victims go through their healing process, like facilitating whether it's professional talk therapy or providing housing and you know financial education or whether they're working in a specific kind of healing modality um, and just kind of uh, creating a space for the healers to receive rest and opportunity uh, themselves because you know as survivors even though we've done the healing work there's no such thing as being done so that's what the nonprofit is focused on. Yeah, I love it. We have a lot to talk about tonight, but in regards to healing, that's a topic that comes up a lot. Obviously, with this topic, it attracts a lot of people who have been through a lot of really deep, dark, emotionally triggering things. 
So we've done extensive discussions about healing, and I know that you've written a book and you've done a lot of work, not only on yourself, but also to help other people with their healing journey. So yeah. we're going to get into a lot more deep things, I'm sure. But if you could summarize what healing means to you specifically in regards to this topic mm. of child harm and trafficking. Yep. What does right. healing mean for someone who's been through this type of evil? I think the understanding that memory can be physically stored in the body and that with um, the conscious effort of, of the mind, or maybe not conscious, but using the mind in different capacities, like um, in, in um, a meditative state, um, there's a lot of different types of body work, but understanding how to connect um, and unfreeze, un unpause, if you will, um, those memories and allow yourself to not necessarily remember, that's not always necessary, but release and make space. Um, and that's how you, um, by, you know, finding where, where it's being held physically in the body, um, that, that's a key aspect. Um, and the thing that I talk about in my book, the most important thing that I talk about in this, I would call it a booklet <laughs> right now, um, but it's a starter because what I'm talking about is the writing process that I used for over 25 years to come to many, many continued levels of healing and epiphany. So I talking about dream journaling and documentation, um, you know, dear diary type stuff, and then all kinds of writing, but really delving yes. into with a focus on connecting to your younger self and your future self. I love that so much. People were asking if you can say the name of the book. So it's called Heal Your Story, Find Your Magic, Narrate, yes. Negotiate, Navigate, and Heal Your Story by Writing to Yourself. So I know you oh. can get it on Amazon. I actually just bought it on Kindle this week. It is a really good, she said, booklet. It's To me, it's like a manual even. Yeah. And again, when we talk about healing, there's, it's not to quantify or compare anybody's trauma to another, but this type of trauma is very unique and very different than a lot of types of trauma or traditional healing methods. So it's definitely not a one size fits all strategy for healing. And one of the things that Monique talks about often is the unique approach to healing the individual. I loved, um, I forgot what page it's on. I think it's chapter two, but you said we need to find therapies that address every part of our person. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about like the mind, body, spirit aspect of healing the complete self? Sure. So I'll just use me as an example, because that's what I based the book on. Um, so um, I always in my childhood, living all over the world, um, always imagined myself uh, to be some type of artist. If I could like picture myself, I would be a painter or a dancer. Um, so tapping into those um, practices becomes part of the healing process because, you know, a lot of people wouldn't look at dance or painting um, necessarily as a therapy, more of like a leisurely practice. And it can allow you to think or experience things in, its, in an abstract way. And when it's something that you wanted to do as a child, and you're giving yourself the space to do that, even if it's just one thing, you're creating a, an opportunity for almost like a time tunnel to that younger version of you that would love to do that and creating positive experiences in the present so that when you go into the physical memory in the body and have to almost, you know, not everybody has to do the reliving, but there is a certain aspect of feeling, right? You're, you're, you're going through these feelings, um, giving yourself also that younger self who experienced those feelings, also giving that part the chance to in, do something enjoyable and say like, look, we're doing something that you always wanted to do. I There's something that. about that. I love that. There's a lot to unpack just from your book. Um, it's a really interesting manual. Again, it's called Heal Your Story, Find Your Magic. You can look for it on Amazon from Monique Anna. Um, a lot to talk about. I don't know if we should start getting into healing or if we want to kind of back up and talk more about 
your story and your experience and specifically what you're doing today to help other survivors and to help other people with this? Yeah. So um, for me, um, when I was in my early 20s, I actually had some interaction with groups um, that I didn't understand at the time. And it's actually just been very, very recently that I've really begun to um, understand that I was interfacing with some pretty nefarious um, forces. So I had this childhood of being all over the world, um, you know, begging on the streets um, and many other things. Um, you know, there was a, there, there's always layers, right, of, of what's happening. Um, so there's the outside view. And I always, like we were in the, in the States for a while, CPS actually interfaced with us and let everybody go multiple times. And it just, I feel like, you know, obviously that was the 80s, so things have changed. Um, and I think that there's still a huge education process for uh, making people in the public aware of maybe what they're looking at. Um, and also um, providing people more of an opportunity to to delve into this, because I think when people hear about this, it pulls on their heartstrings. But having actual ways to take action mm -hmm. um, and really give somebody a sense of like, okay, I'm help, I'm helping, I'm part of the solution. So I feel like what we're doing um, with this writing process and kind of delving into what it means to continue to heal, because when you have experiences, it will remind you of a story that's been closed for a very long time. You have to have a practice that you can go to that will help you, I'm going to say, metabolize and kind of alchemize that experience. And it becomes easier the more you do it. Um, so, but, you know, when it comes to what's happening um, with um, children, I think that um, whether it's like an international group all over the world or whether it's just a very small space it's the same kind of process and so i know that my healing story isn't going to necessarily um help at the level that you know child rescue is working at um but i know that what i'm doing is providing an opportunity for it to be normalized to um talk about things because i think a lot of people go through these things when they're younger and they don't actually even know what they were experiencing. It takes people verbalizing and then go, wait a second. Yes, 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 yes. And people begin to be able to realize what they experienced. Maybe they won't be so desensitized when they're seeing something, when they're seeing something go down instead of turning away when you see something happening, you know, just being a little bit more proactive and questioning. Yeah, 100%. That's why, so for, for people who are new here, who don't know kind of what we're doing and who we are, Vets for Child Rescue is a nonprofit. We are dedicated to exposing and eradicating child trafficking in the USA. It's a massive problem. The statistics are alarming. Most of this is unreported. So it's, a, it's happening at a greater scale than most people understand. But to Monique's point, Awareness is such an important aspect of this. It's not just a feel good word that we use because we want your donations. It's because awareness means all of us have the responsibility to take action or to be part of the solution, to do something. Awareness specifically reduces the predator's ability to operate. The more people who are walking around aware of what's going on, what to look for, how it can look, what are some signs, what should they do? Don't be scared and just freak out. What can you do? Who can you call? If you can't take action, who, who can? And then it's also part of bridging the gap between survivors and the people who don't understand what this even is or how it affects people throughout their life. So there's a lot of layers to that, obviously, but we are making an effort to raise awareness in every possible way. And that includes bringing on survivors to share their story and let people know that this is real. Yes, it really does happen. Yes, it is really terrible. Yes, it is happening in a greater scale than the media would like to admit. And yes, 
it affects people for their entire lives. A trauma that happens to you as a child can affect not only your subconscious and your nervous system and things that you may not even be in touch with right now, but it affects your relationships. It affects the way you see the world. It, it affects your mood and your anxiety and all these things. So Monique's message and people like us who have really gone within and done the work to heal, it's not an easy process. We're never gonna make it sound like it's easy or like you should just get over it and move on. It's not that at all, but it is about acknowledging that something bad happened to you and that that bad thing will affect you mentally and physically. It will stay with you. So you have the choice then to face it head on and to decide how to design your healing journey. And again, the healing journey can be very unique to the individual. So Veterans for Child Rescue is also a group of veterans and service members that are highly trained to fight bad guys and who are not okay with kids being harmed, specifically within our own country. So there's a lot of volunteers and people that we have an investigations team, we have operators, we do counter trafficking operations all over America. So there are various aspects and layers to what we do. Now on this account, we go live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time and we talk about different aspects of child trafficking because again, what we're doing is raising people's awareness. We are letting them know that this is all around them and we're giving them the tips and experiences that we've endured in order for them to know how to protect their own children. Sweetney says, amen, it's about healing from the inside out. There's a lot, a lot of layers to that. We've done some really in-depth discussions. Hey, Mayfly, thank you guys so much for being here. So back to Monique's story. I think you touched on this briefly, but I don't think people got it like I got it. So you were born and raised in a religious organization. So the definition is cult, right? Now let's unpack the word cult because I don't think people understand that. And I think people get really cringed out, which I understand because it's not like a feel good word. But I looked up the definition just for interest sake, because again, understanding things is important here, right? When people don't understand things, they tend to judge or fear things they don't fully comprehend. So breaking this down and unpacking things is really important, not only for the survivors and their healing journey and coping, but it's important for people who haven't experienced to understand what we're talking about. Know the enemy because knowledge is power. So let's define the word cult and then we'll have Monique talk a little bit more about that and also the nefarious group she interacted with after that cult. So the definition of a cult, there's a few definitions. A system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. A relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. So a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices that others may not understand, technically every church could fit that definition. You realize that a cult is essentially a group of people who believe the same thing. So generally the word cult is nefarious to most people. And again, I'm not here to essentially make you feel good about cults, okay? I'm here to define it for you. We're just breaking it down. It's a faith community. It's a religious group. Some synonyms are church, denomination, faith, sect, belief, affiliation, movement, group, body. So in understanding the definition of this word, we want to explain a few aspects of it that people might not understand. We're not here to say, you know, just because you're part of a religion, you're in a cult and that's bad, right? But part of this awareness of how child trafficking happens and even the culture or infrastructures that support it in our country, it's important to understand that a lot of these organized groups or movements can start as something harmless and sometimes they can evolve. Now, this is my personal opinion. I have no problem with what any adult wants to do with their life, with their body, with their sexual preferences, like do you. The minute you start having children in a cult or involving children in a cult, that's when it's on a different level. This is my perspective. So again, if there's a group or movement held together by a shared belief or commitment, that could go wrong in many ways, specifically, if there is a person or group of people 
that is essentially the leader or the guru or the prophet or whatever they call it that tells people how to think and how to live their lives. That controlling and manipulation is when it can get next level, we'll just call it risky, because not everybody has the mental capacity to really advocate for themselves and stand strong in their beliefs and essentially hold, hold true to their self-identity. Now, again, going back to children, it's one thing for adults to decide to do that, like, bro, do you? But when you have a child in this environment, I, I use a super oversimplified analogy just to help people comprehend this, right? If you're an adult and you know the world and you choose to join some other group, you know that contrast or that difference, right? So that's a decision you're making. If you have a child who's born in this group and then raised in this group, realize, of course, you can teach a child to believe anything you want them to believe or to speak any language you want or believe in any God they want. It's not their choice. They are essentially being taught those things. You can teach a child that red is blue and they'll grow up their whole life. And if every video and book and picture and thing they see, every every song they listen to reinforces that belief, they will grow up believing red is blue. And there's nothing weird about that to them. That's just what they believe. To so take that a step further, if you tell them red is blue, but everyone else in the world believes that red is red and they're wrong and we're right and they're evil and we're the only ones that are safe, love, peace, happiness, whatever, and they're bad, dangerous, et cetera, et cetera, that train of thought, again, can not only be dangerous and controlling, but it stands to reason why it could manipulate the way that child thinks and the way that they interact with life, even the relationship that they have with themselves and their intuition, their ability to advocate for themselves, their ability to make decisions. So I hope that helps. I'm really summarizing and short versioning this whole concept of what is a cult, because I want people to understand it. It can happen at a lot of different levels in a lot of different ways. And there are many, many groups that would fit the definition of a cult today in our, in our society. Not all of them are bad. Not all of them are evil. Not all of them are hurting children. Not all of them are doing bad things. Some may even be contributing in a positive way to society. Again, the definition of cult is a group of people who be believe the same things. So that's a very open-ended definition. Now, I'll let Monique talk a little bit more about the aspects of the cult that she was born and raised in, just to sort of unpack that further, because I think there might be some aspects of it that surprise a lot of people. So, for example, another, another conclusion people jump to when they hear the word cult is that it's something, I don't know if I can say this word on TikTok, but it is very dark and of the, can I say satanic? I don't know. Tyler, <laughs> some people think it's always going to be a certain type of look. It's not always the case. And it may surprise you that a lot of different religions and groups can fit the definition of a cult. A lot of times cults have a certain public facing image, probably every single time. <laughs> Pause for effect. Probably in every single case. There's a public facing image. Think of it like a corporate brochure with people smiling and happy and yay, this is what we do. And then there's a lot of layers and only the people who are very sort of dedicated or leaders within the cult really understand what's actually going on, what the actual intentions of this cult are. So if anyone has questions about that, please feel free to leave them in the comments. That's a very summarized version of that definition, but I think it's important for people to understand. So Monique, if you have anything to add to that, um, and if you want to take it from there and talk about whatever you want to talk about, the floor is yours. <laughs> I have two things that I want to talk about off the top of my head just from listening to you. The first one is that um, just recently um, a Baptist church um, made public um, the names of 700 people in their church, like from the 1980s on, um, that were previously, you know, private member uh, records that they didn't make public um, and released information um, other churches also hold similar kind of tribunals internally when they get complaints. Um, and many things are like, this is within the church. It's a private domain. We don't need to involve the authorities, right? But this church, I can't remember where, but a, a church just recently made 700 names public. And I really feel like um, it's important for those type of things to happen because it's going to dissuade people that are previously 
protected by entities. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that many times, most times, you can find the money vein within the cult concept. Um, there's a clear line between money making and the control of people. Um, many, even churches today, are you know um, billion dollar real estate companies, uh, corporations that you know are doing very well, and um, that leads into the whole concept of you know what is the most valuable product um, in this world right now, and um, so. I think that um, the group that I was raised in specifically um, did have a purpose in the United States. And um, the leader of the group decided um, at very late 70s that he needed to get out of the United States. And I believe that was because there was a certain level of permission that had been given uh, by the authorities, if you will, for him to create this new cult with the hopes of, you know, being able to um, move people to a certain persuasion. Um, but, you know, he decided to take the whole concept of, um, are, are we allowed to use the word trafficking? I don't remember. If, sorry. Yeah. If you said, are we not supposed yeah. to? Trafficking is okay. I think. Okay. Um, but he took that concept to a whole new level. Uh, he told our parents that they needed to have as many children as they could um, because, you know, he went to third world countries and saw parents, you know, standing on the corner with five, six kids out there begging. So as an example, I lived in Tokyo um, and Osaka as well. And we would have vans, you know, vans of kids that would go out on the street. We were all little, you know, foreigners speaking Japanese asking for donations. And, you know, I calculated the money on that. And just from the little trips that we did, um, not the little trips, I mean, that's what we did. We did that, you know, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, most weeks, um, and, and uh, made tons of money. And that that was one of the less evil <laughs> things that were happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that in and of itself was like, I mean, I, I don't regret being able to live in Japan or Philippines or Mexico and, you know, delve into other cultures because I feel like it's given me perspective on the world. Um, but it's just amazing to me that, that that kind of thing, you know, it's not unique, first of all. It's, it's happened before and it's happening right now. And... Um, when people really understand the ways that, that the manipulation can happen. I mean, the blueprint is the same, whether it's one handler who has, I don't know what better term to use than stable of people that they are, you know, turning into commerce uh, or whether it's a group all over the world that has a body of elders who are dictating and, you know, executing, the wishes of the, you know, pyramid Ponzi scheme at the top. So those were the yeah. things that I wanted to say. Yeah, lots to say there. So again, if anyone is unfamiliar with this topic, we're talking about some pretty deep, dark things here. We're also trying to say it really nicely for the sake of this platform and also just for the sake of not coming across too strong to anyone who is unfamiliar. So if you guys have questions, please let us know in the comments. Sometimes things like this are very obvious to us or very known to us. So we sort of summarize them or skip through them or maybe even laugh about them because we have a dark sense of humor. But if you guys have questions, something may be obvious to us that isn't obvious to everybody. So it's it's pretty much an ask me anything situation. Thank you so much for to our mods for keeping the conversation clean and making sure everybody's behaving just real quick. We are here to talk about solutions and raising awareness for child trafficking. So we're not here to talk about politics. We're not here to talk about all the other things that you could possibly be upset about in the world right now. We want you to realize as well that child trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise in the world. So this is not like a top 10 issue or something that we just randomly picked to be mad about today. This is something that we're actively fighting against, but we also realize it's a massive opponent with a lot of support and a lot of funding and a lot of secrecy behind it. So what we're doing is shining a light on the darkness because 
what these bad guys don't want is to be exposed. What they don't want is for their plan to be uncovered. So with everything Monique is talking about, for example, can you imagine what could have happened differently in her life if just one adult, just one adult could have had the awareness to see a child begging on the street or fundraising and be like, hey, are you okay? Where are your parents? Have you eaten today? Are you safe? Where do you live? Are you, why are you in a third world country? Like what's going on here? Can you imagine what would have happened if one person would have had the awareness to ask questions? At minimum, it would have reduced the predator's ability to operate. It would have made it harder for bad people to do bad things to kids. She probably would have spent less time on the streets. Now I'm being very candid about this whole discussion because again, this is something that's just so familiar to us. We want to drive this point home to the people who are not familiar with it because we want to bridge the gap in communication. Someone asked a question I'm going to scroll up and look at. A lot of people are asking for the types of signs. Hand Me Down says, is there things we as American can do to help kids keep it from happening? What to watch for? Hand me down. I love that question. That is, in fact, why we exist. So you're in the right place. So if you go to our website, it's vetsforchildrescue.org or v4cr.org for short. We literally have an entire website that's like a manual of what to do and what to look for and signs of child trafficking and what is grooming and what are the tactics they use? What are some apps that should not be on your child's phone ever? What are some monitoring apps that parents can use to monitor their child's internet activity? We have so much information on there. It's all free. And in addition to that, we produced a free documentary. It's a very well-made, high-quality documentary. It's called Contra Land. You can also watch that on our website. So everything is at the same link. We also have a link in our bio. Contra Land is a documentary that exposes a lot of the cultural infrastructures and support behind child trafficking, but it also gives you a glimpse into some of the counter trafficking operations that Vets for Child Rescue does to essentially arrest and convict the bad guys. Earlier, Monique talked about the bad guys being exposed and the authorities coming to check on them and then releasing them. So uh, there's, again, a lot of layers to this, but a big part that people don't understand is two things. Monique, I'm sure you have a lot to add to this. One, just because a child is rescued doesn't mean they're safe. Meaning just because CPS or whatever authority comes to take a child from an unsafe situation, if they put them in an institution in a third world country, it may or may not be a safer place for them to be. They may actually experience the same or worse abuse there. The second thing is that just because a bad guy is arrested does not mean he's behind bars, meaning sometimes they're behind bars for a little while and then, then they're released. Sometimes they never even get convicted. So it's not just arresting them. It's also seeing it through to conviction. So Vets for Child Rescue has a 100% conviction rate. That means all the bad guys that we are directly responsible for arresting are behind bars. That being said, we have an entire investigations team. And again, we are all volunteers. So we have an investigations team that also assists in a lot of rescues and investigations and counter trafficking operations as well. So check out our website. If you guys have any more questions, again, you can always leave them in the comments here. We'll do our best to get to them, but please do look up this website. As soon as you're done here, go to vets4childrescue.org or link in our bio. Thank you guys for all the hearts and the love and all the shares. All right, Monique. What do you think people need to know specifically about child trafficking in the USA? What's the biggest thing that you just wish people understood? I think you touched on it when you said the grooming process, um, because as an example, when I said that we had um, uh, child protective services come into one of the colony commune houses that we lived in, um, this was in Texas, um, we had been drilled, trained, um, we role played questions that the authorities may ask us and what our answers were going to be. And it was written down and we would take turns being the authorities and the other one being the child. Um, this kind of grooming and teaching us what to say, um, made me feel almost proud of being able to lie my way out of that situation, it definitely gave me kudos by 
the cult leadership in the house at the time for a brief time, like, wow, you really did a good job and stood up for Jesus because that's what we were doing when we protected um, the infrastructure. You know, the outer layer was the not the charity that's helping missionaries. And then, you know, there were just levels all the way through. Um, but to tie in a little bit more about what's happening right now, um, I think that there are many angles that people don't understand, um, especially with the internet now um, and the ability to create multiple kind of characters and stories. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody is familiar with these kind of situations where um, a con man took off with someone and drained them of money and made them think that the FBI was after them and all these bad things were happening. Um, I believe that there are a lot of parents, um, you know, because many times the, um, the trafficking that's really happening is generational. It's uh, mothers who had the same thing happen to them and it was part of their story. It was, in other words, these children when mothers were pregnant knew that this was going to be the life for the, the child. And um, also another way that this happens is using these scare tactics and creating um, true fear um, and, and controlling the situation by with threats and they're not easy threats. It's always, you know, the big ones. Um, but um so a child could be going to, to public school and be going through something incredibly traumatic um, weekends and even nights. So um, and they may be taught, groomed what to say. So there's so many layers, especially with children, um, seeing someone on the streets, you know, like Kim, like you were saying, that may not even result if they went to CPS, that they would end up in a good situation. So there's not easy solutions right now um, all the way through. You know, a, a lot of, I mean, we see this all the time about judges being um, prosecuted right now for being the veins inside of the judicial system that are continuing to traffic children through their, you know, court systems and pulling them in. Um, and that's a that's a difficult thing to look at as evil when we've been trained that, um, you know, certain authority. In other words, the where would be the best place if you were that kind of person to be maybe working with children, right? Because then you have access. So it it's it these are very complicated conversations and there's a lot of illusions that are being played out in front of people. And um, sometimes they just don't know because they've got all this fear tactic in Hollywood that they're pushing at them, bombarding them to keep them from actually seeing what's actually going on. Full stop. Yeah. hundred percent. So many good things you mentioned there. Real quick, I want to draw out something from what you said that people may not have picked up on. Because again, a lot of people have certain ideas in their head and they think that's how things work. But when you sort of expand that perspective, it helps people see this entire, more of the story. I don't think anyone can see the entire story, but understand the various ways that this can present and when people ask questions like how did you let that happen why didn't you leave sooner right those types of questions we want to bridge the, the gap so i never want to take personal offense to someone who is simply unaware right good for them that they didn't experience it we're here to teach people what to look for but i think a common misconception is that people will trust someone who shares the same belief system as them or attends the same church or prays to the same God as them. So Monique said something about in scripting their responses to authorities and in grooming the children, they were um, told that they were what doing something good for Jesus. So it was a Jesus cult. This was a yeah. Christian cult, right? So to everyone who may also be Christian, I want you to think about it's not really the irony. It's more about like, we want you to realize that predators can wear many faces and that this can look a lot of different ways. It's not 
generally going to be a guy with a ski mask jumping out of an unmarked white van with a big weapon to beat you up. It's not going to be that obvious, point one. And point two, sometimes it's the people or the organizations or the religions or the belief systems that you may least expect. We did an episode of, of these live streams a couple weeks ago, and it was called How Predators Gain Access. And we really broke down a lot of the most common ways that predators can prey on children. So again, to Monique's point, predators will position themselves in positions of authority and power so that they can gain unsupervised access to children. So realize that predators are strategic. They create a strategy to see how they can prey upon a child. So they may be your teacher, your sports coach, your Sunday school leader, your religious leader. They will purposely put themselves in positions of authority. And part of the grooming process is gaining the trust of the child and often their family. So it's not just grooming the child. A lot of times it's grooming, like she said, it's a generational thing. It can be the whole family. It can be the babysitter that's just way too eager to spend extra time with your kid for no reason. This can present in a lot of ways. So we are not here to instill fear in anyone. We're not here to be like, the world's a terrible place, fear everybody. We are here to share our knowledge in the hopes that it will empower you and also make you more aware of what to look for. So for example, in that live discussion, we talked about some pretty alarming statistics. For example, statistically, most child predators consider themselves religion, religious, sorry. They consider themselves religious. The majority of child predators are religious people, full stop. There's data that faith-based communities are easier targets for them because, and this is not a bad quality, because they want to believe the best in people, because they have a community, because they're very welcoming and inviting and they want to recruit you into their community, because predators prey on vulnerabilities. So again, we're drawing different things to your attention only because we want to expand your view of this issue. Again, this is a know the enemy situation. So grooming, whole thing. I think it's so important for people to understand that as well, because I think in every case, pretty much every case, child abuse starts with grooming. There's a process that the predators use to desensitize the children, get them to let their guard down, get them to trust the predator, get them to think they're nice or fun or sweet. They normally form some sort of secretive relationship where they give them gifts or candies or treats or experiences or whatever it is. It's like, oh, this is our little secret. Don't tell anyone else. You're so special. That's why I'm giving this to you. Again, this is a gradual process to gain access to the child. Now, in the case of something like a cult or a religious organization, yes, Shama says psychological manipulation. Yep. Another word for that is brainwashing. Again, these are tactics that can be applied in different ways in different situations. There's a lot of things that are super unique to a specific experience that may not be applied across the board to everything. But most of these concepts we're talking about are widely, broadly apl applied to almost every, if not every instance of child harm and trafficking. Yes, ma'am. Psychological manipulation. So with the grooming process, um, it's a big part that we want people to understand. Again, we have a whole page called What is Grooming on our website. It's Vets for Child Rescue dot org. All right, Monique, what else should we know about specifically about the experiences you had at a as a child? What do you think someone could have done someone from the inside out knowing what you and I know about the way you were scripted the way you were groomed, the way the situation was laid out? It was very controlled. What do you think that a third party outside adult could have done to make a difference in your life? That's um, more than a million dollar question. <laughs> um, so I've thought about this a lot. Um, my my family, my um, blood family, mom and dad sides, um, both were, you know, fairly aware of what was happening, but didn't know what they could do to help. And um, it would have taken... Uh, one of the people who interface with us at a, at the level of authority, um, you know, governmental level to um, change the situation. Because when we were overseas um, without a passport, we were, um, you know, there was no way to really like anchor into who we were. 
Um, it's hard to say what, how my life could have been different if somebody would have come in and rescued. Um, I like to daydream about, or I did as a kid, um, and I guess I have kind of as an adult in the healing process, but kind of imagined like what my life could have been like if I had been able to, you know, go to school and have friends and stay in one place and have kind of this alter alternate reality. Um, I would have wanted to end up with family somehow. Yeah. Like if, if I had been rescued, I wouldn't want to end up in some stranger's home. As an example, I would want to be with somebody who knew me as a person and, and who I had a history with. Um, so I don't know if I'm I'm answering your question, um, but I'm trying to. It's not imagine. a short answer. Yeah, it's not it, because that's not how it went down. Um, I do know friends whose parents like one of the parents left the group and then came back and rescued their children. Um, that was always kind of a fantasy of like how to, you know, what, what, what I would do if I was rescued. Right. Um, but I think, you know, for, for children who are put into the foster systems, um, and then they age out, um, you know, many times those are the people who end up being in danger of being re-exploited as adults as well. And sometimes those are the women that end up becoming that, that generational story of, you know, what the mother did, the child, the children are being forced to do. Um, but I think um, if, you know, if we're able to stop the cycle of mothers being put into those situations, then we have a really great chance of hopefully um, them bearing children who are in those situations. Yeah. So I'm not talking about the women who are actual cage, you know, um, slaves, but those that are living kind of the generational story of this is what happens. We don't have a choice. So I don't think I answered your question, but it's hard for me to hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. Other than, you know, maybe I would have been able to go to school. And, you know, I think if I had been able to do that, um, I would have been, some sort of like genius math whiz. No. <laughs> More of a genius. Yeah. So we have um, a lot of people that, you know, we see often and that are really close friends and supporters here. Uh, Shama Warrior experienced a different type of child trafficking as well. And a U.S. Marine rescued her. She says in the oh, wow. comments, when U.S. Marine Corps rescued me, my life was still tormented for years. And that's why aftercare is so important. So it's interesting to me, it's, it's beautiful to think of a child being rescued. When yeah. I came across Veterans for Child Rescue, this was in 2020. So to back up a little bit, 32 years old, I left the organization that I was born and raised into when I was 20 years old. So fast forward 10 years, I knew it was evil. I knew it was abusive. I knew all the things, I knew all the reasons that I left. But in 2020, the word trafficking sort of became a little bit of a trending word and in researching Veterans for Child Rescue was when I realized, like it wasn't so much that I was searching for answers. I was just researching like, how can I help who's someone who's actually making a positive impact in this? So first of all, I was blown away by the fact that there are these hardcore trained warriors who care enough, like first of all, are aware that this is an issue, like, whoa. And second of all, care enough that they're gonna use their training and all their resources to go hunt bad guys and save children. Like I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. But it also came to my attention around that same time, again, 30 years old, like, wow, that's what it was. We were trafficked. That definition in my head, it, it offered me a lot of closure that I wasn't necessarily seeking, but it still just helped connect a lot of dots and define a lot of like, oh, that's what it was. Like, why would someone do that? Okay, that's why. It doesn't mean, you know, just understanding things doesn't mean you're justifying them. It's just helping you define them and understand what happened to you part of unpacking trauma and really dealing with the healing process. So all that being said, I love the idea. I love the concept of a child being rescued. I think that's such a beautiful, amazing concept. Um, I also think about, you know, I've thought about that often. What would have happened if someone would have rescued me? Like, what would that have even looked like? <laughs> But also, what would that have meant for me? And like you said, it, it would have meant that I probably would have gone to school. Um, it could have had a very different outcome in my life. 
But at the same time, we talked to a lot of survivors who share some really, you know, terribly impactful stories about what they experienced. And when we really unpack it, we, we circle back to this point of if you could have changed your past, if you had a choice to choose something different at the time, if you could have had a different life or upbringing, would you choose that? So I want to ask you that question before I tell you what everyone says, but would you choose a different past if it was possible to go back and change things or redo them? Uh, you're asking me this question? Uh, no, I, I already know the answer to that because um, I really like who I am right now and I feel very purposeful and I know that I understand the spiritual aspects of what I experienced and, you know, um, I don't think that this is a continued story that's supposed to be part of humanity. And I know that it's our choice to change it. So it's a matter of taking the action steps that we know we can take. And I know that I can control myself. And I know that I can um, continue to be an example of like the triumph that can happen. Um, and I just want to, you know, because when I was doing my healing work, um, I started first working through an eating disorder and um, I didn't know anybody who had healed. Um, and I stopped practicing when I became pregnant in the cult with my baby girl. So I looked at myself as the model. I said, Hey, I quit practicing this eating disorder because I was creating a human being. If I can do it for her, I can do it for me. So even just something as simple as that part of the healing process, it's, it's, it's a huge obstacle to face. Um, and I know that a lot of people may be suffering from something like that and it not understand that it's connected to some trauma from childhood. So even for people to begin really becoming aware of what's happening around them and the potential for rescuing a child could come from the action of taking a look at their story and trying to understand their, the way that disease and illness is, is manifesting for them um, and, and heal their story. And then they're going to become more aware because the layers of trauma, because, you know, generationally, like people say, oh, mental illness runs in my family. I'm like, uh, trauma, CPTSD and trauma, dissociative, all of the mental illnesses, depression, they all run in humanity. There's no family that has escaped this. It's in all of our blood. So no, I wouldn't change my story because um, I want to create paths for my children, my great grandchildren, my my siblings, you know, my friends, my loved ones. I and I do believe in in the good story that good wins. So I love everything you say, y'all. Tap the screen for Monique. May I ask a question? <laughs> yes, go Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. So when I was a child, and I never even talked about this before. But um, I was uh, abused, sexually abused by someone in the family. And when the topic got brought up at school, I mentioned it because I didn't know that that was a bad thing. I, obviously, you know what you're told. So when it was brought up to the family members, I was told to keep my mouth shut because it would ruin the family member's life that was doing it. And uh, yeah. um. And I was also taught to love this person because that was what I was supposed to do. It was family. And, I, and the reason I'm asking this question is because I want, I know out of uh, 80 people, there could be a small child in here that needs to hear this. I didn't know what was happening to me was bad. I was also told that I would be labeled as, and I hope this don't get me in trouble, but as a homosexual, as a child. And in the eighties, the early eighties, that was a very taboo topic. And you all know that I'm, I'm telling the truth about it. So, um, they didn't want me to be labeled that they made it sound like that. If I said anything that it, it was uh, the, all the labels that came with it, plus it was going to ruin my family. So I had to endure this situation for a good portion of my childhood. Um, is there anything that you could say to these young children that may or could be listening right now that may be in that situation that are being told that exact same thing? 
it's not your fault and your feelings are right and you're allowed to speak and there are people who can help. That's what I would say. All right. Well, I, I, I conquered mine. I, um, yeah. I even went to the funeral when they passed away, oh, uh, wow. forgive myself, um, and to move on from it. Um, but I, 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 like you said, I was a lot stronger from the situation as I got older because I was able to break that, that cycle with my own family. Um, but it terrifies me to know that this is going on with these, mm, these young children and a lot of them have no resources and they don't have, cause they're so shut in. You know, when a family member finds out about that, they're not allowed to go out and hang out with certain friends. They they can't go to school and talk about certain subjects. I was literally told at home that if a teacher asked this or if they ever asked this again, um, just to, you know, like you said, lie about it. Um, and we basically trained. Now, this if they ask you this question, because they're going to ask you, they're not going to ask you straightforward. They're going to ask you in a roundabout way um, or they're. And I was just so, I didn't know, like I was a child. I, like you said, the red and blue thing, I did not know. I had no clue that this was a bad thing. Um, I, I understood that I was lying. And in some, some weird way, I, I kind of felt inside like, well, why do I have to lie about this? If this is okay, you know? <clears throat> um, but I was taught that it, because other people won't understand. And, uh, so you guys just keep doing what you're doing man Newell, thank you for sharing that i know it's not easy i know that even though it may have been decades ago years ago it's still painful and again it's not that we want to dwell in anybody's pain but sometimes other people need to see that first of all this is real and they sometimes need a face to connect with like wow this actually affects a human that i'm interacting with right now but it's also important for people to realize how much it affects people throughout their life. It happened as a child, but those memories and that trauma still lives within you. So again, Monique started this by saying you can choose to face that and you can choose to deal with that, but there's also no finish line to healing. There's no like one through 10 process and then it's over and you'll never be triggered again. And yay, you're totally normal now. But there are ways to learn to alchemize it, to use, you know, use it to help other people like you're doing with us here today. So what I would say to that little boy, so I want to talk to two people right now. I want to talk to that little boy who was told to take it and shut their mouth and not talk to anyone and not tell the truth and who was taught to lie. And I also want to speak to the man who you are today. Because most people, most children who suffer abuse aren't given the validation or the acknowledgement that what they experienced happened. So I'm not even talking about support and help or therapy. I'm talking about acknowledging that the situation exists. That little boy deserved parents and strong adults in his life that could have protected him and that could have done what's right. No matter who was involved, no matter who the predator was, they should have protected that little boy. That little boy deserved that. No child is ever, full stop, ever at fault for abuse. I'm trying not to use that word too much. It is never, ever the child's fault. And most importantly, it is not the child's shame to carry throughout their life. So what happened to you at the time, a lot of people don't realize something that's very obvious to us. Children don't have a choice. There's no like, oh, if I do this move correctly, I can fight off this adult. That is not how the dynamics of a child and adult work. It is not a choice for a child to receive the harm or to, you know, run away. In some cases, you can avoid certain aspects of it. And a lot of us have some pretty intense survival skills, but it is never the child's fault. So the validation that it happened and it is evil. I am full stop defining it as evil because we are not here to change anybody's mind about what happened to them or, you know, there, while we can draw out some positives of who we are today as humans and as people contributing to the world and protecting other people and advocating, we can absolutely decide 
to reach a positive conclusion or outcome of what we went through, but we are all going to acknowledge that anyone abusing a child, that is evil. That is evil. There is no other way to frame that situation. It is not subjective. It is objectively evil. So you don't have to find a way to be okay with what happened to you, but there is something so powerful. I'm sure you've heard me talk about this and I love how Monique used this word too, release. Release means you don't carry that shame with you. Release is proverbially ripping the claws out or the energetic attachments to you, the control, the shame, the guilt, the torment, all those things that haunt you you do not have to carry that weight because it was not your fault. It is not your shame and it is not your responsibility to be traumatized by that today. Another word for traumatized is controlled by that today. When it happened to you as a innocent child who could not advocate for themselves, who could not physically defend themselves, who didn't have adults in their life that protected them and even who had adults who perpetuated the abuse and shielded the abuser. That little boy did not deserve that. But today, the man you are, you can choose the reality you want to experience. You can choose to no longer be controlled by that trauma or that past or those beliefs or whatever it was that manipulated you. You can also choose to advocate for others, to protect other children, and to be an example of someone who has chosen to heal and overcome. So the short version, what I would say to that little boy, I'm sorry, and you deserve better, and it's not your fault, but I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that you are so valuable as a human life, as a child, as an innocent little boy. Your innocence was taken from you and that was not your choice, but it will develop you into an incredibly strong, empowered man who will save other children. We can find a purpose for everything. We can find a way to now position our lives in a positive way. And that is true empowerment. When you can decide how you live your life today and decide to no longer be controlled by your past, that's why we're here today. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you for using your experiences to help other people. You're very welcome. <clears throat> but I do want to um, just go on to say that I did leave a, live a pretty horrible lifetime um, as a young child. However, um, I do want to let everyone out there know there is no end game, like they said a moment ago, but the amount of strength that I have in my body because of it and the amount of knowledge that I have because of it and the amount of courage that I have because of it is it's not measurable. And again, I would, I would never, as you said a moment ago, I wouldn't go back and change anything as horrible and as hurtful as that was mm, to me. It's horrible. Uh, it brought me here to be a great father and a great husband and a great human being. And, um, I'm very strong and knowledgeable now. And, um, again, I, I as bad as it was, I would, I, I wouldn't go change it because I, I'm afraid that if I did, I, I may have been part of that cycle, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm here, I survived it and I'm ready to kick butt. So where are they at? <laughs> Tell you, man. Welcome. You have found your tribe. Sweet Tenacity says, so valuable. Every single person here has their position in this fight. I believe that, and I want to thank everyone for standing with us. Ultimately, we are here for the children. I think, like Monique was saying a little while ago, it's one thing to realize that something really terrible happened to you, but it's an entirely different thing when you realize this is happening on a massive scale to other kids right now. A lot of us come out of a situation like this feeling like we're the only weird one or us in a small group of people we knew just experienced this weird thing in the corner. So we just try to assimilate and live a normal life and pretend like that didn't happen. But when you realize that this is happening still in our country to countless children, that's not okay. That's when I feel like we're here because there's no option not to be here. Like, how could I choose to simply ignore this? How could I choose to just stand by and let other people figure it out because the borders and the politicians and all these other reasons that I could blame everybody else and just live my life, I don't feel like that's an option. So there are so many ways that everyone here can be part of the solution. Again, we have so many free resources on our website, that's for childrescue.org. There are 10 ways you can be part of the solution and take action tonight. Very simple, very actionable things that you guys can do. So thank you guys again 
for being here, for listening, for sharing this, and for being part of the solution. Thank you so much. All right, so Monique, back to all the things you've been talking about. We're kind of jumping around a lot here. So you mentioned that you left this cult when you were 19. And then do you want to tell us a little bit about the interactions you had, you said, with another nefarious group? What was that about? Yeah, so I can't really get into a ton of detail about it because I've just recently started to feel able to unpack that story. I feel that the, the work that I did in my healing process, a lot of it was about my childhood story. And it's just been recently that I've really um, been able with, you know, without being triggered by it to kind of really take a look at what happened. But what I can say for sure is that um, the facilitators of these channels that are turning children and adults as well into commerce um, have deep veins in all aspects of our society. Back to the concept of the illusion that's being created around us. And um, it starts with, you know, family members and expands from there. Um, so there's the, the process. That's probably the biggest thing that I could say is that there's probably um, more trafficking in in people that you know that are around you. Whoops, we might have lost her. Oh, she, oh. Yeah. Oh, you're back. Am I back? Yeah, sorry, repeat you that. You said yeah, my, my phone is telling me that it, my phone is going to die here in a minute, so I'm going to have to um, wrap it up, but. I think that's the most important thing to say is that if we're each working on our own personal healing, it gives us the ability to have more confidence and clarity when we think we, we see something that we're looking at. And I love the fact that you have these 10 action steps that people can go to, to um, actualize and face it. But there are many cultures around the world right now that, normalized and made it a, a, a generational secret that was part of the story. And no one thought that it was going to change this, this concept of children standing up and us changing it um, is what's making society shift and understand that this is not okay. When it's protected as a secret, then it makes it okay. And it, these are the old world stories and us adults who are vocalizing and saying, you know, I had a woman who's, who, who's, she knew whose husband was, um, you know, being inappropriate with me, talked to me on the phone like a, a year ago and said, I didn't understand that this was something that was bad because it, they had been told that this was according to the word of God, that it was okay to do. And so she apologized to me for that. And I felt like that's really dumb, but she didn't go through it. So she didn't understand I'm like, this goes over. And then, you know, there's mothers who, you know, don't even see that the man that they've chosen to bring into their home is perpetuating that what they experienced as children. They're so unconscious that these programs and scripts are just running in the back of their head and they're on autopilot and recreating and not breaking the generational cycle. So really it, it's about like looking inside and changing yourself first and then finding um, collectives of people who are doing the same. So, hundred percent. I love that you started by saying that most of the time it happens by someone the child knows. Statistically, yeah. and I take statistics with a grain of salt because they're often wildly in underestimation. But statistically, more than ninety percent. It's something like ninety-six percent or something of the time. Child harm and trafficking happens by someone the child knows and is supposed to trust. And it's normally a family member, like a physical relative of the child. There you go. Again, not the boogeyman and a, and a white man in a white van. Right. Yeah. That's that's powerful information. Mm -hmm. It is part of the reason that we're here to raise people's awareness. Exactly like Newell just said, who was just in this box. People protect their family. I take issue with that when you, they protect the predator over the child. Yep.
again, a couple weeks ago, we had a pretty um, interesting conversation about how predators gain access. And I actually played quite a few clips. You can do an, a YouTube search and hundreds of videos come up. But I played a few clips where there were different types of churches and the preacher, pastor, main person was found guilty of harming a child within his congregation. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking appropriate action, the church covered up for him. <clears throat> now, point one, that's not okay. But point two, they offered no support to the survivor, to the victim. So this whole like hug and prayer and forgiveness, specifically when you're neglecting and not even taking action to help support, assist the survivor, like I cannot with any of that. But unfortunately, it's all too common. So again, this happens and the more the, the sooner people are able to face this evil the more we can create solutions to counter it but it is up to we the people it's up to all of us to hold people accountable to yeah. hold our elected officials accountable to hold our you know the justice system the church the leaders whoever are in these positions of power if you're really protecting the predators and covering up for them to the extent of telling a small child like noel just said that he has to keep it a secret because, oh, no, you might hurt, offend, whatever, this predator. Like, that is disgusting to me, to say the least, and I'm being so calm about that. But it's good for people to know that that is generally how that happens, and that is how they will most likely encounter that type of child harm within their circle or life experience. So the more you know, the more you can protect children. Kim, my phone is going to die here in a second. It's talking to me. Okay, no problem. We really appreciate you being here. Real quick, guys, her website, she has a nonprofit. It's called Victory Sanctuary. I'm sorry, Victory Garden Sanctuary.org. If you get kicked off later, I'll keep talking about this. I want to thank okay. you so much for being here. Um, I want to tell you about her org real quick. They are survivor founded and led, and it is a survivor house for survivors of specifically trafficking. Is that right? Yes, we're the focus right now is um, creating um, a retreat program for um, survivor leaders. So people who are were victims and now are actively working with others who need to find healing. So creating resources um, and and networks that can communicate and help each other, like a networking process, um, but also a physical retreat. Um, here in the, in um, Southern California for um, those leaders who are doing the work, who are out there every day on the streets doing rescue or, you know, working with women who are just learning how to operate in the world for the first time, um, creating a space for them to experience rest and to continue with their healing process. So supporting the ones who are supporting, you know, the victims who are needing just so much assistance to even get to what we would call, you know, normal function. Mm. It's a lot of work. Love that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Again, guys, that website is victorygardensanctuary.org. Please check it out for more information. It's based in California. Monique also has a book called Heal Your Story, Find Your Magic. It's on Amazon, so you can buy it. It's an incredible mm. manual about healing. So, her phone uh, ran out of battery, uh, but we appreciate her for being here.